strings of life may be glad. It's hard to feel sad when you are on my
Good evening. We want to welcome everyone this evening as we get started here. Just glad to have everybody who's present. We're here celebrating 103 years of uh, the Midwest Church of Christ. And we have James Frank McGill Lectureship. We appreciate everyone in attendance tonight. We'll talk more about it. I'm just going to open up this evening uh, with a prayer, uh, with a song, and then we'll open up with a prayer. And we'll, uh, everybody knows, we'll start out with number 60, number 43, more about Jesus. 43, more about Jesus. At the proper time, we'll have Brother Burns. He'll lead our hearts with a word of prayer at the proper time. Number 43, more about Jesus. More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness seen, more of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness seen, more of his Jesus, let me learn a more of his holy thing. Discern a spirit of God, my teacher be, a showing the thing of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus, a more, more about Jesus, a more of his saving fullness. I'm more of his love who died for me. I'm more about Jesus in his word. I'm holding communion with my Lord. Hearing his voice in every line. I'm making a faith all see mine. I'm more, more about Jesus. He's more. Jesus on his throne, our riches and glory all his own. More of his sanctuary and creed, and more of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his Notes number 63, and then we'll have scripture reading and prayer. Um, one, one, not scripture reading, but prayer. Uh, 63, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. Oh, what a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Ooh, what peace we often form. Our faith. Ooh, what needless pain we bear. All oh, because we do not care. Harry, everything to God in have we trials and temptation and that trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged into the Lord in prayer. And we find our friends so faithful. Are we weak at him? 
Let us pray. Father in heaven, O wise and almighty God, creator and ruler of all things, we come before you with our head bowed and our hearts are humble. As we enter your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts and praises on our lips, because thou art God and beside thee there is no other. Lord, we are thankful that you blessed us to see this time and place in our lives. We realize it, it wasn't by our own strength, our own wisdom. But Lord, it was your love, your mercy, your long suffering and patience that brought us to this time in our lives and we wanna say thank you. We wanna thank you for so loving us enough for you let your son die our death, take our place on the cross, that we might have life. And Father, we ask you to give us the strength that we would go forth and spread the good news, dear God, that God so loved us, dear God, that you gave your son that we all might be saved. Forgive us of our sins and our transgressions. Strengthen us in our daily walk. We want to thank you for tonight. We want to thank you for the leaders of this church and their vision. We want to thank for, we're thankful for all the men that you sent our way with the message that you have given them. Dear God, we ask you to grant us a receptive heart that we will become more and more like your son Jesus. Now Lord, there's many sick among us. Visit them in their place of sickness, strengthen them. Many of us are troubled in mind and in spirit, God. Things are out of our control. We need your help, dear God. Bless us and keep us. Now thank you for tonight and, and all that you have granted us we just want to praise your name and say thank you. In Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. Church, say amen. amen. Church, say amen again. We're thankful for those that have joined us tonight in person and those that are watching in line. As we begin our J. Frank McGill Sound Doctrine and Restoration Kentucky State Lectureship, we're thankful um, that you've taken time out of your schedule to be with us. Um, we've had a great time thus far. We're still trying to just get over our homecoming weekend. We had a great time this weekend with the singing and the preaching. And tonight we're just going to continue that, that, that Holy Ghost um, good time all throughout the week. I'm here before you right now to introduce our first speaker on tonight. Well, first off, I just want to thank Brother uh, Arnest Poppy, who was here with us at 12 noon today. We had a great discussion this afternoon. You, if you didn't miss, see it, you need to go back and tune in and watch it again. But we had a great time discussing the Word of God. And tonight we're going to continue to move forward with our great friend, Brother Larry Sawyer. He brings us uh, greetings from the Bricks, Big Spring Church of Christ, and we're thankful. He's here with us every year. He's a fixture here, and we're just excited to turn him loose. Um, we'll have a congregational song. Let's ask Brother Ray to give us a congregational song, after which the next voice you will hear will be that of Brother Larry Sawyer. Don't want to hold him back. He's ready. 
We're going to do 437. We'll just do the first and the last verse. Amen? Amen. And then we'll let him go. Amen. Where could I go? 437. Living below in this so sinful world, only a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore, tell me where could I go but to the Lord? So tell me where, oh tell me where, when I am seen. King a refuge for my soul, and I am need mm, to save me in the end. So tell me where could I go but to the Lord? Life here is grand with friends I love so dear. Comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, tell me where could I go but to the Lord? So tell me where, oh tell me where, when I am seeking a refuge for my soul, and I'm needing you got to have money, and I don't. I'm so poor I can't pay attention, you know. It's bad. It's bad. Uh, I did redirect. Um, I preached for a small country church over in southern Indiana, the Big Springs Church of Christ, where it's always big. We've been running about 100 in attendance and having a really good good time, baptized a few here and there, and we're just uh, we're blessed. It's good to be back at the Midwest. I, I uh, glad to know that I'm a fixture down here. I love this place. I uh, thank you for the invitation to preach the word, and I assure you I'm going to do my best to do that. Uh, they put me in the lead off. I'm not batting up clean. I'm not batting clean up. I'm, I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing the lead off. And I, I, I'm just praying that I can bunny it or do. I can put it in play. Just let, me, let, let me put it in play. That's all I want to do. Now my, the theme of this thing is. Live the Word, and my, my title is, The Word is My Weapon, and my text is Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, which says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, um, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He said, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up on their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written... Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And, and all this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. I think it's interesting that you, uh, when you read Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, you've got to back up just a little bit to, to realize that Jesus was just baptized. That, that Matthew chapter 3.13 says that Jesus, um, he went uh, out to find John. He made his way to the Jordan to be baptized by John. And John said, I can't do that because I'm not worthy to be the one to baptize you. But Jesus said, let it be so now. It is proper to fulfill all righteousness. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. The heavens opened. The Spirit of God descended on him, and God spoke. This is my Son, 
who I am well, whom I love, I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Listen to him. Now that says that later, but he says, This is my son, and you need to realize that. And and I want you to understand that when Jesus came up out of the water, he was ready for battle. I'm not gonna tell you anything new tonight, I guarantee you. Uh, this is more of a call to action. Because I, I think I think we just kind of we, we kind of find our spot where we're baptized into Christ and we find a spot on the pew and we just sing the songs and pray the prayers. And we, we, just, we, just, we just sit there. Instead of standing on the promises, we're sitting on the premises. All right? And so I, I, I think that Jesus, when he, when, when he got up out of the water, that the first stop he made was he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And somebody said, oh, me. Oh, me. Now, I don't know that much about the wilderness, but I do know it's one of those places you just don't want to hang out. That Jesus was led by the Spirit, that his journey on earth, first stop after the water, was the wilderness. When you get serious about living for God, the devil gets serious about stopping you. I mean, the devil goes into overdrive. He, he, he just decides that I don't want you to do what God wants you to do, so I'm going to go after you. And if the devil's not after you, you need to worry about that. Because he got after Jesus. Now, you'd say, well, I don't want the wilderness. Well, Jesus, he, he, he took a little wilderness. Moses, uh, he, he wound up in the wilderness. And, and the children of Israel wound up in the, in the wilderness. And so all of God's children are going to find themselves someday in the wilderness. You say, well, I haven't. Well, you will. It, it's just a matter of time. It's coming. Now, I don't know what that wilderness is going to look like. But I understand that the wilderness is is a tough, tough place. So when Jesus went to the wilderness, it wasn't a play date with with the devil. It wasn't a meet and greet, you know, like kind of for your fellowship. Hi, how you? I'm fine, how you? And Jesus wasn't just going out here to play games with the devil. It wasn't a period of fellowship. He went to be tempted and tested by the devil. But the devil says, I'm going to get a hold of you and I'm not going to let you go. And Jesus said, bring it on. So it's a one-on-one, it's a battle royale, it's a knockdown, drag-out fight, head-to-head, toe-to-toe. And it's kind of like that, you know, wrestling. Let's get ready to rumble. You know, it was, it was one of those moments. It was like, it, 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 this is not playing games here. Now, in order for Jesus to get ready for the wilderness, he went without food for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, one of the things, one of the no-nos that the church is, we, we don't like to talk about fasting. Hello. No, we don't. No, you, wait a minute. You want me to do without something? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, when you fast, when you pray, and when you give. Now, we'll talk about giving. We like that one. And we talk about praying. We might not talk about praying as much as we talk about giving. We talk about, we talk about giving. We talk about praying. But wait, wait a minute now. You want me to fast? That Jesus went without food for 40 days and 40... It doesn't sound like the best plan to get ready for a big knockdown, drag-out fight. Nothing to eat. Nothing to give him strength. No nutrition. Found himself in a weakened state. Loss of energy. The effect on his body and mind. And all the Bible's got to say is he was hungry. I don't know if you've ever been on a fast. I've done that a time or two. You're looking at me. You need to go on one soon, son. Either that or paint Goodyear gear on your Goodyear on the side of your, your vest there. You know, when I when I think about this fast thing, I think about going three days. Man, I'm about to die. Y'all, I mean, I'm on, I'm I'm kind of like on the two hour plan every time. You know. <laughs> I went on a diet the other day. It was, it, it was the turnaround diet. Every time I turn around, I ate. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you just stop and think about it. That, that he does without food for 40 days and 40 nights, and the Bible says he's just hungry. Are you kidding me? Now, his opponent says, I got him. The devil says, I got him. He is the tempter. He is our adversary. And he approaches Jesus 
And he says, if you are, if you are, if you are the son of God, why don't you, why don't you put you a Cracker Barrel breakfast right there on the table, right there? Why don't you just turn him stones and biscuits and gravy, all right? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, I, listen, I'm thinking, I, I had not anything to eat for 40 days and 40 nights, and I know I've got the power to change those stones into butter biscuits. I'm thinking, I'm doing that. Yeah, it, hey, we're not going to wait on it. No. You know, Jesus knew he had the power because later on he turned a sack lunch, a, a McDonald's Happy Meal. He turned that thing into a, a meal that feed 5,000 people plus. That's just the men. They count the women and kids. You know, what do you think? He, he took a sack lunch and said, he's got the power to do this. And he says, no, it is written. God didn't put us down here just to eat. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm all for eating, but, but God didn't put us down here to eat. It doesn't say you can't eat. It just says that we need to focus more on the word because that is our nutrition. The devil took him, and, and by the way, that's Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. The devil then took Jesus, stood him on the highest point of the temple, and he said, I tell you what, if you jump off, man, that'll be a show. Everybody likes to be entertained nowadays. You want to get a crowd? Get a show. And man, make everybody happy, let them dance around. Woohoo! yes! Man, you, you jump off that temple, and you just, I mean, you, you headed for a crash, man. You, I mean, you're going fast. Picking, you're picking up speed as you go. And all of a sudden, you just kind of put on the brakes. You just stand up on your feet and go, ta-da. <laughs> the devil said, and here's where the devil quoted scripture. I don't know about you, but that kind of scares me. Because he quotes, he quotes Psalm 91. He says, he will command his angels concerning you, your life. In the angel's hands, they won't even let you strike your foot. You won't even stump your toe. Perform a miracle, and everybody's going to believe. Man, it's, listen, this is a fast way to greatness. Do not put the Lord your God to test, Deuteronomy 6, 16. Took him to a high mountain. And it's interesting here that the devil's giving away something that ain't his. Yeah, have you noticed that? I'm telling you what, if I'm giving, if I'm giving your money away, I'm giving it away, all right? And then all of a sudden somebody says, well, give something you I don't know about that. And the devil says, listen, you see all of that out there and all that splendor. I'm going to give it to you. Just bow down and worship me. He's giving away something that's not even his to give. And Jesus, once again, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him. Don't nobody be bowing down to anyone or anything else. Away from me, Satan. Now, when this ended, Luke says in Luke 4.13, the devil finished all this tempting. He left him until an opportune time. Hmm. You see, when, yeah, you see, when I'm done with the devil, he ain't done with me. You know, you can move off and leave the devil and don't even give him a forward and an address and he'll find you. I mean, he'll hunt, he'll hunt you down. That, that, that he wait, he said, I listen, you, you won this round, but this is round one. I'll get you like I'll find you in a moment of weakness and I will get you. Yeah. You know, the devil is bad business. He's always he's always casting doubt. You know, if you are the Son of God, if you've got that kind of power, if you can do this, yeah, yeah, if, yeah it's it's it, and, and you think about it, the devil's big three. It is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That, that John, in John, 1 John chapter 2, 15, 17, says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whatever does, whoever does the will of God is going to live forever. The lust of the, the flesh... Oh, man, that feels good. I like that. That's, that's a, ooh, it looks good. Yeah, I believe I just risked one eye. You know, it's, it's one of the, you know, that old story, you know. I, you, know it, you, you, you think about the, the, the whole thing about I'm going to be smarter than God. It's like God's with all. That all three of those showed up in the, in the Garden of Eden. 
the guy, the, the, the devil is doing business with Eve, but, but Adam's standing right there, okay? I mean, Adam's not man enough to stand up. He, he, he's not going to stand out front. He let, he let Eve do the talking. And so Eve is listening to the devil. He, the devil's crafty, according to uh, Genesis chapter 3. The serpent's crafty. And he says, you know, nice garden you got here. And she says, yeah. And he says, well, can you eat everything here? And she said, no, can't eat of that tree. And he said, did God really say that? said, I bet if you ate that tree, you'd be smart. I bet it tastes good, too. And she looked at it, and she thought, boy, it does look good. And, and, it, and it, it really is the kind of thing that I, I, think, I think I'd be smarter if I ate that. And so she gave in. She gave some to her husband. He gave in. And they lost the battle. Here, here's, here's what I want to try to get across tonight. We're, we're at war. But we ain't acting like it. We we too busy counting nickels and noses. We we don't even realize that we're in a knockdown drag out fight with the devil, and he is trying to damn us to hell and get our souls. That that we we are in a fight. We are in the wilderness on the battlefield, and we've got to believe that that is true. Because when you believe you're in a battle, you approach life in a completely different way. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In other words, my fight is not against you. It is not a black and white fight. It is not a Palestinian-Israeli uh, fight. It is not against us. It is me versus him, the devil. And I need to remember that. That it's not flesh and blood that I'm fighting. That I'm against the devil, the tempter, my adversary. Who 1 Peter 5 says he, um, he roars around, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You ever, you ever get those, those, those videos on Facebook? Every now and then I'll be scrolling on Facebook, those videos. And all of a sudden, I don't know why they send these to me, but it would be, be some lion that jumped on a, a giraffe. He's gnawing on his legs. Why is he gnawing on his legs? It's always his back legs. Gnawing on his back legs. Well, if he can get him down, he's got him. And you notice how they fight. They always single one out. Always single one out. They're looking for the weakest one. Look at, look at, look at. Somebody told me a long time ago, the banana that leaves the bunch is the one that gets peeled. I mean, I mean you, you stop and think about that now. And see, see, people, people out there in the world, they ain't got time to come down here and listen to the Bible. They ain't got time to, to focus on the Word. And so they leave the bunch, and they're out there on their own, and they wonder why God, wonder why the devil just gets the best of them. Be alert. Be sober-minded. The devil's out there. And Ephesians 6.11 says he's got these schemes that he does. You know, you hear Ponzi scheme, and you go, whoa, that's bad. Somebody's stealing somebody's money and getting a lot of it. That that word scheme literally means guerrilla warfare, evil, ta evil tactics. It means that the devil doesn't fight fair. He doesn't, he doesn't come face to face and you say, hey, I'm the devil. I like you. You like me. We can go places. He doesn't do that. He's always looking for a crease, a, a crack in the arm. He's always looking for a way to get his foot in the door. And one of the scriptures that really bothers me, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Goodness. Isn't that, the, isn't that a, a wolf in a sheep's clothing right there? He masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising. Then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, he's even got angels that are dressed up to make you look, think, that they're on your side when they're not. So it's called action. Suit up. Suit up. Get ready for battle. Ephesians 6 says, put on the armor of God. I was watching a football game the other night. Dude lost his helmet. How you lose your helmet? I, don't, I mean, I'm strapping that thing on. You couldn't pull that thing off. I'm, I'm probably not going to stick my head in there anyway, okay? I'm going to stand on the sideline somewhere. I don't wanna, it looked pretty rough to me. Dude lost his helmet. And he got a penalty because he kept playing. I'm thinking, dude, you ain't got your helmet on. What you playing for? Stop that. 
You're going to get a lick on the head. They're going to knock you in the middle of the next week. You don't need to be doing that. Ephesians 6 says, put on the full armor of God. That you need to suit up. If you are in a fight, you are in the war. That's fact, Jack. You, we're in it. So what you need to do is get your armor and get out of them street clothes and get that armor and put it on and stand strong in the Lord's power. And when all is done, when everything is settled and the dust starts, you know, calming down, that you're still standing there because you're holding on to the Lord and His power. You got the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. You got feet that are fitted with the gospel of, of peace. You got the shield of faith, which is this huge shield, right? Now, this is a little bitty, you know, like a, like a saucer. It's like this huge thing. You got the shield of faith, and then you got the helmet of righteousness. So all these major organs that are covered. That's our Kevlar. Kevlar. That's our bulletproof stuff. And Ephesians 6 says, oh, by the way, don't forget your weapon. Don't forget your weapon. It's the sword of the Spirit. It's the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says, for though we live in the world, we don't war, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. We, we, got, we, got, we got a powerful weapon. Our weapon is from God. And it thoroughly equips us for everything we need to do for him. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, 17, all scriptures, God breathed, useful for teaching. Rebu- we don't like rebuking or correcting, but that's what it says. Training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Our weapon is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says that. That our sword, that our weapon, it lives within us. John would say in 1 John chapter 2, I write to you, dear, dear children, because you know the Father, I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. One of the reasons we're losing the battle is because the word doesn't live in us. Because we don't spend any time in the word. But the word is supposed to live in us that our weapon is an imperishable seed that it's planted within us, that it gives us a a new birth, that it gives us a living and enduring hope. That's 1 Peter chapter 1. I love what Psalm 119 says in verse 11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I will not sin against you. I think that means to memorize it. Wait a minute, you you, you just stopped preaching and started meddling now. You start talking about fasting. All right, we 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 not listen to that. All right, you, now you're talking about memorizing the Bible. No, I, I, that's exactly why. The psalmist said, "I hid it in my heart." If you get my Bible, I still got it here. You can't take that away from me. The psalmist also says in one nineteen verse one hundred five, "Your word is a lamp to my feet; it's a light to my path." So my call to action is this: suit up. Put on the whole armor of God. My call to action is read up. My daddy died suddenly in 2004. It was November the 9th. We buried him November the 14th, the day before my birthday. My daddy, he 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 had an 8th grade education and he had an episode with his health and he thought he was dying and he decided he wasn't doing near enough for God so he went to Nashville School of Preaching down in Nashville and he, he, he he had a seventh, eighth grade education. It, it was really hard on him. But he, he, he got his degree from National School of Preaching until, until he died. He was still preaching. He used to work for DuPont there in Old Hickory, Tennessee. Ken Fleming over at um, Newburgh. Ken and Daddy worked together. And, and, and Ken said that, that Daddy was the kind of fellow that he, that, that he worked for God and, the, and DuPont paid him. Because he, 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 he was always he, he ran around with a little New Testament in the back pocket, and he's always he's always wanting to, he, he's trying he's trying to teach you, man he's trying to teach you. But I just remember my daddy sitting on the back porch with the word reading it. Read up, store up. 
put it here. Stand up. Don't hide. Don't cower. The word, our weapon, is powerful. And when we're standing on the word, we don't need to hide. And then pay up. What does that mean? Remember what Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 through 8? I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul said, I paid up. I fought till I died I fought not going to give in not going to give up I finished I stretched my neck out and I crossed the finish line I tore that tape I I might not have finished first but I finished and I died a believer and I know there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me not just for me but everybody else longs for his appearing. May the Lord bless the reading and the teaching of his word. Church say amen. The word is my weapon. Are you ready to suit up and fight the devil? Oh, amen. Our next speaker comes to us from the Newburgh Church of Christ. Midwest and Newburgh go way back. We've had a relationship for generations at this point. Brother Baker and Brother McGill, Brother Stevenson and Brother Fleming, and now myself and Brother Brian C. Jones. He's been preaching for a number of years. He's known all over the brotherhood, but he is in Louisville. He is our brother, and we're thankful to have him in this area. We're going to have another verse of a song. Ask Brother Burns, it was a verse of a song, after which the next voice that you will hear will be that of Brother Brian C. Jones, Senior Minister of the Newburgh Church of Christ here in beautiful Louisville, Kentucky.
Church of Christ. Can we give God some glory for 103 years? Come on, everybody. Amen. Happy anniversary. We're grateful to God. We bring you greetings here uh, right across town at the Newburgh Church of Christ, and we're honored to be here tonight uh, at the Midwest Church in such a historical occasion with the transition from Dr. Stevenson to Brother John Poo Malone. It was just great being here yesterday, seeing the torch passed, and we're praying for a good transition and all the work that God is going to do here. We know that God will be glorified. Amen. We're grateful to be in the presence of Brother Stevenson, uh, the elders of this great church. I think you should always appreciate and clap for your leadership. Come on, everybody. Let's just appreciate your preacher and your elders, amen. And I'm grateful to God tonight to have a couple people from Newburgh here. Certainly, um, we want them to know we appreciate you being here. One of my elders, uh, Elder Rodney Dorsey, we're happy to have him here tonight in support of his preacher and a number of Newburgh people here uh, as well. And I'm just happy to be in the city working with Brother Pooh Malone, uh, just a double barrel preacher. Uh, he going to preach you in the glory and sing you in the glory. Amen. And so we're just grateful to be able to work with him. I've known him, him and his family for quite some time. And he comes from good stock. And we thank God for the deposit that he has placed in, this, on this, in the person of Brother John Pumalona. I'm always happy to have my baby with me. Just wave your hand like you're in a parade right now. Just in, just in case there's a couple single brothers in the house. I don't want no problems. I don't want no problems. I promise you, I'm too old for that. I don't want to fight. Amen. I'm, amen. I have to tell somebody she's my sister, you know. Um, praise God. And um, good to have one of my brothers, um, Brother Kenneth Ray from 36 and Garland, my brother in Christ and Kappa. Uh, you do know all the prophets in the Old Testament had canes, right? Come on now. I, amen. Good to have him here. Uh, and it's just a blessed opportunity to be here. I'm, uh, listen, what's Brother Sawyer? Man, awesome job. Let's clap one more time for him, man. You just came in your own way, and you blessed us. And it reminded me of just the great gifts that we have in each uh, container. And we're just grateful to God for that. And it was a great time to meet Brother Haygood from California. I know him from Facebook. So this is my first time meeting him yesterday. So I'm happy to meet him and to be able to talk with him. Hopefully we can talk uh, further as well. Uh, turn your Bibles to Psalm 19 tonight. And they told me that I had 20 minutes. And usually my introductions are 20 minutes. And uh, I'm used to giving entrees, not appetizers. Good to have Brother um, Jerry Macon, my good friend from the West Broadway Church as well, in the house tonight. Uh, Psalm 19, I want to read just a couple verses for the sake of time, and I'm ready to hear Brother Fate Hay Good III tonight. Looking forward to hearing him. Psalm 19. Verse number seven, if you're there, just shout, I got, I got it. The Bible says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever, the judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. Last verse. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. I have been assigned a title. Let me see if I can find it. Um, Lord, work on me. Lord, work on me. Beloved, I believe that Psalm 19 is a powerful poetic psalm in the Hebrew Psalter 
written by David. And most of you Bible readers and truth seekers, beloved, know who David is. Yeah, David, the one that was overlooked by his father while he was out in the fields smelling like sheep, sweaty, working hard, being faithful with his earthly father's assignment, gets a tap on the shoulder and say they want you uh, at the consecration. Uh, God had overlooked seven of David's brothers and rejected all of them. The prophet Samuel has to say, do you have any other sons? There's one out there tending the sheep. You know David, and David gets anointed in front of the seven brothers that were placed above him, and I've come tonight to help somebody understand it doesn't matter who rejected you in your life when God has a blessing for you he will send somebody to come find you to bless you any blessed folk in the house tonight that know that God will send somebody to come and find you when God gets ready uh, to bless you so we know David as the uh, victorious one he was the giant killer who killed Goliath from Gath with a smooth stone, which tells us that when we fight uh, in the army of the Lord, we use a different weapon, right? We don't use the weapons of the world. So he took down Goliath with a smooth stone and just in case he wasn't dead, he took his sword, took off his sword and cut off his head and killed him and said back then they didn't want me as he hold up his head. Amen, somebody. But now I'm hot, they all loan me. So he took out Goliath. So we know who uh, David is and David was the king and David made some mistakes in his life, but David was a man after God's own heart heart does not mean that he obtained always perfection in receiving God's heart but he was always after somebody shout after he was always after God's heart then when you look at Psalm 19 beloved um, it is almost as though when you're reading this Psalm that David wakes up one morning and bends back the blinds and peeks out the window and looks at the landscape of his life and sees the attributes of the almighty and looks at nature and he sees God speaking to him. And I want us to understand when you're reading Psalm 19, you're reading a revelation that David gives us about the handiwork of God and about God's ability to speak through that which he has uh, created and you see David giving three powerful revelations. The first revelation is David's revelation of God speaking through nature. When I was growing up in the Church of Christ, uh, they, they used to always say that if you didn't believe in God, just come outside and look up. Uh, because when you look up, you can see the attributes of the Almighty because nobody is more powerful than God. Nobody can create what God uh, has created and nobody can do uh, what God can do. You ought to just go outside every now and then a Midwest and just look up and you can see the power of God and God is speaking to you through his creation when you see the sun and you see the stars and you see nature and see what God has created it ought to help you know that God is speaking to you to let you know who he is and what he is able to do I wish I had a witness in this place on tonight so we need to understand that in David's psalm David is giving us a revelation of God speaking through nature, which is really understanding that we all need to have a God-centered worldview. We, 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 we see that David is saying that God is speaking in the first six verses, one through six, and he's speaking through nature, and it tells us that we all need to have a God-centered world view that I look at the world and my view of the world is centered around the fact that God created this world and God created the human uh, universe and when you look at Genesis 1 1 it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning time God sovereignty created power heavens space and the earth matter can nobody do us like God can do us 
and it argues when you look at God speaking to us through nature in this psalm in verses 1 through 6, it argues for a intelligent designer. Because nobody can structure the universe, Brother Stevenson, uh, the way God has aligned the planets and aligned the plants and aligned the people. Amen, somebody. And we ought to look at God as a sovereign creator that created the universe with an intelligent uh, design. So let me ask you, are you like David in verses 1 through 6? And when you go out, do you see God speaking to you? Do you see God's handiwork and you see what God is able to do? And if God can create all this and create human bodies, because the Bible says in Genesis uh, 2, 7, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Sisters, God is the only one that can create something out of dirt. Don't you try it. Amen, somebody. Don't you try it. And I want us to understand the second thing that you see. In Psalm 19, verses 7 through 10, is David's revelation of God speaking through his word. God, hear this, he speaks to us through his word. And when you look at verses 7 through 10, you'll find the power of God's word. I don't know about you. But I never would have been able to make it in this life had it not been for the word of God. It was the word of God that kept you when you lost a loved one. It was the word of God that kept you when you lost your job. It was the word of God that kept you in this painful, pitiful, perilous pandemic that took millions of lives. Child of God, it was the word of God that has kept us down through the years. So that's David's re uh, revelation. So, and, and he's talking about God speaking to us through his word. So we listen to everything else that speaks to us. But how many of us listen to the word of God speaking to us? We listen to Facebook and YouTube and come on and give me an amen tonight. And people that don't even know God and know what the Bible says. We got internet scholars in the church today and we listen to everything else except for the word of God. And I want us to understand what he's saying in verse number seven. No, notice this please. He says the law of the Lord is perfect. The Torah he's talking about God's law and it is without blemish and it is perfect and watch this this is David talking somebody shout David talking he says the law of the Lord is perfect in restoring the soul because David knew that there was a time in his life that he needed the word of the, of, of the Lord to restore his soul because David was also a man of the God's own heart but he was also an adulterous murderer saw a woman taking a bath one day from his roof and she was a 12 out of 10. Brothers, y'all ain't saying nothing. I can't hear nothing tonight. I, and, and David knew he was the king. The Bible says it was the time when the kings went out to war. So he should have been out with the army of Israel. But David was on the top of his roof because he was a king. And he said, I'll send them out there and end up taking Bathsheba. Uh, like that name, Bathsheba. And he saw her and he ended up uh, conceiving a child with her. And then tried to cover up the pregnancy by killing Uriah. And so David was a bad boy in the realest sense. Amen, somebody. And so he understood that in order to be restored, he needed the word of God. Because I need you to know that many of us look at David, but we don't think about ourselves and what we have done. And so just don't look at David, look at some things that you have done in your life. And I, I think that it's high time for the church of Christ to get back to the word of God. Because we're living in some desperate times and let me tell you something in this current cultural climate where people and politicians 
and parents and even parishioners have no moral code, no principles, no precepts, no power, because we don't have the word of God. We used to be a people of the book. We used to be able to quote scripture and live scripture. Now half the people we got don't even know the difference between Genesis and Revelation. And, and, and I want us to understand that we need to get back to the word of God. Because let me just tell you something. Anybody ever get frustrated with the way people behave? Anybody by a show of waved hands and amen, somebody, even today, Brother Jones, I'm in church tonight because somebody at work, amen, somebody, got on your last nerve. Should have been patting you on the back and they've been stabbing you in the back. Let me tell you what our problem is, and I want you to take a deep breath. Our problem is we have left the word of God there has been an evaporation of application. And I'm going to spend the rest of my time, I didn't come here to get you to shout, I came here tonight to get you to think. Somebody going to make you shout this week, praise God. I'm probably in a few minutes, praise God. But I didn't, I didn't come to shout you tonight, I came to get you to think tonight. Sisters, brothers, your life would be better if you actually applied God's word to your life. We're expecting people who just merely attend and assemble a worship to move the church when they don't give you any additional and extra support in ministry. Let me see if I could say that better. Coming to church ain't enough to move a church in the direction where God wants to use us to take over this city. So what we have done is we've made the least bottom level requirement of assembling all we got to do. Say amen when you can. You can't say amen, just shout ouch. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds or surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, watch this, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I want us to understand that when Jesus, yeah, of course Jesus came. He came to die for the church and he came to establish his church. But guess what? Beloved, Jesus came to establish a kingdom. Somebody shout a kingdom. I said Jesus came to not only die and establish his church, he came to establish a kingdom. Because I think, Brother Sawyer mentioned this in Matthew 4, uh, the devil, and when he was tempting Jesus, he says, all the kingdoms of the world, you missed that word, all the kingdoms of the world, I will give you, because they're kingdoms of this world. But Jesus came to be a king to establish his kingdom. And in order to have a kingdom, you got to have a king. You, you got to have commands. You got to have subjects. And you got to have territory. See, what God wants us to do in the church of Christ, God wants us to live up to a standard that's worthy of the kingdom. But now we have people who have capitulated to culture and they're more influenced by culture when culture should be influenced by the kingdom. Remember he said this, Brother Pooh, he said uh, when he was teaching them how to pray, he says, Our Father, which art in heaven, come on, help me tonight, hallowed be thy name, here's my shout, thy kingdom. Thy will be done, come on, on, hold up. Hold up, hold up. Jesus said, thy will, God's will, shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. What are you saying, Jesus? I want the behavior of my kingdom subjects to reflect the behavior that's going on right now in heaven. So we are sent out as kingdom subjects to change the world, and the world is changing us. And that's not God's will. He 
his will was for us to be that city that sits on a hill and to shine, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We'll never get there unless we get back to the Bible. When we talk about the word of God, we're talking about living a principled life. Because many times in church we teach people, Brother Malone, we, we, we all are guilty of it. We teach people what not to do, what not to say. And all we think about as long as you don't cuss, drink, or smoke, you're going to heaven. You don't have to give. You don't have to take communion. You don't have to do no discipleship. As long as you don't cuss, drink, or smoke. I wish I had five witnesses that could shout amen. That's, that's it, Brother right, Jones. No discipleship, no love, no fruit of the spirit. And I'm telling you, in order for God to take us where God wants to take us, we have to get back to learning how to live a principled life. Now, what's a principle? I know I got to go. A principle is a fundamental truth that serves as the foundation of a belief system or chain of reasoning. So as a Christian, it is more about just coming to assemble it is more about what you do in your household. It is more about what you do in your alone time in your car. It is more about how you behave on your job or on your business. Beloved, we have to live by biblical principles. Well, why you don't say bad words? Because the Bible says that I shouldn't do those things. See, that's how you live a principled life. And for the love of me, if we're going to save the next three generations, we need some people who have the confidence, the courage, and the conviction in Jesus Christ to do what he says he wants us to do in his word. So we got to understand, David understood this. David understood that if it wasn't for the word of God, he says in Psalm 51, you ever, ever, ever felt dirty before, beloved? Yeah. Ever done some things before that only you and God knew about? Yeah. Ever thought some thoughts that only you and God knew about? Yeah. And you would be so embarrassed tonight if uh, Midwest put all of your last week on these screens here tonight, wouldn't you? What if you just put your thoughts on one of these screens right here? <laughs> Lord have mercy. I got an honest witness tonight. So we know we felt dirty before. That's why David says, create in me, O oh God. A clean heart. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me, I wish I had somebody, the joy of your salvation. And sustain me with a willing spirit. Let me get out of here. What has saved my life is God's word. Weeping may endure for a night, but how many of you know that joy <laughs> comes in the morning? And we know God calls us all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Jeremiah 1, 4, 5 says that the Lord knew Jeremiah before he formed him in his womb. Yeah. And see, those verses are things that gives us our identity, that lets us know who God has created us to be, that we're not an accident and a blimp on God's radar, that God created us with intentionality to serve a purpose. And I want us to understand that. Let me end with this. Um, your homework assignment tonight is read the totality of Psalm 19 because I didn't have enough time to finish it uh, if you invite me back next year Pooh, I'll do it again okay <laughs> praise God praise God let me end with this um, I want you to know that your family your children your lives
livelihood, sing your hands. Sometimes the best sermon you preach is the one you live and not the one you speak. I would not be who I am today and I'm still growing, but if it, if it had not been for my mother and my, my father modeling Christianity for me in my home. So before I was unjaded from the world, I saw my parents living a Christian life. And that was everything for me. It serves as the foundation of my livelihood and my life. But I want you to know that it's in your hands. <clears throat> Somebody shout, it's in your hands. Let's personalize it. Somebody shout, it's in my hands. A couple months ago, I was watching a um, video on YouTube. And there was a, it was a graveside funeral. The, uh, the preacher was getting ready to uh, say the last words over the deceased. And then there was a brother to the side with a black suit on kind of had gray hair and he was just holding a dove in his hands and he was getting ready to release the dove into the heavenly skies to honor the deceased symbolizing that the deceased was going to be going into the heavenly skies so after the uh, the preacher gave him the nod to go ahead and release the dove he threw the dove in the air of about 20 feet the dove did not fly away it fell straight down to the ground dead unbeknownst to this man while the dove was in his hands he killed it now that may be somewhat comical to many of you sad unfortunate but I'm telling you tonight if there's something in your life that you are expecting to spread its wings and fly be careful whose hands you put it into because somebody could kill it. And many times we are allowing our lives to be led by the devil because we're putting our lives in his hands and we're putting our hopes in his hands and we're putting our dreams in the hands of people who do not know Jesus Christ and do not know our God. Put it in Jesus' hands. I said put it in Jesus' hands. Y'all gonna help me tonight? I said put it in Jesus' hands, because if you put it in Jones hands, I can't do nothing for you. But if you put it in Jesus' hands, he can take the punishment and take the nails. I ain't got nobody in here. And he can take everything and he can build a church that the gates of hell should not prevail against. Whatever you do, put it in Jesus' hands. God bless you. Uh, they must not like Brother Faith. They made it hard on them tonight. <laughs> we appreciate Brother Jones and that word. This is pow a powerful night. Brother, Brother, Brother Sawyer reminded us that we have to use the word as our weapon to be able to fight off the devil. But Jones reminded us we have to use the word to work on ourselves in order to be what God has called us to be. And we got to make sure that we apply those principles in our everyday walks of life. Now we have our closer on tonight. The cleanup man on tonight. <laughs> Ray said, California love <laughs> is in the house on tonight. You, if you didn't know Brother Fate Haygood, you know him after yesterday. He introduced himself to us. And he taught us the word of God. He talked about that Cracker Jack box. Y'all remember that? That Cracker Jack box. And you have to make sure you get to the bottom to get your prize. And we're just thankful that he came all the way from California to be with us. Um, he comes from the Metropolitan Church of Christ there in Carson, California. But like you said yesterday, he's from Compton. Um, which means that he, he, a, he, a, he a spiritual thug. Don't mess. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> but his word is his weapon. His word. The word is his, <laughs> is his weapon on tonight. After <laughs> another verse of a song by, by Brother Joe, the next voice that you will hear will be that of Brother Fate Haygood from California. You know, after hearing all that, I don't think I'm worthy. <laughs> but we're going to let him see who's our king. Number 173, he's my king. 
all day long of Jesus I am singing. I hear my song of joy will ever be. Oh, 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 oh. He keeps my heart bell ringing. Palm his love lives everything to me. Well, he is my king, and no, I nearly love him. He is my king, and no other is above him. Oh, oh, he long. In raptured praise I sing, I sing out, He is my Savior, He is my King. I in His life, and I'm going home to glory. I wear the soul will trust His saving grace. Now go in home to sing and tell the story. I am the humble of the sunshine of his faith. Well, he is my king, and no I nearly love him. He, he is my king, and no other is above him. Oh, oh he long in rapture praise I sing, I sing now. He is my savior, he is my king. He, he is my king, and I know I dearly love him. He is my king, and no one really loves him. He is my king, and I know He's my king. Oh, he's my king. And oh, I well, he's no, no other is above him in all. Yeah, in a rapture to praise us, I sing that he's my blessed savior. He's my king. Y'all come on, give the Lord praise in this place. <laughs> Hallelujah. <All right. laughs> you know, I love Pooh. I, I do. I, I love Pooh. Praise God, I love Pooh. But I know a setup when I see one. <laughs> I know a setup when I see one. Lord have mercy. He <laughs> in a roar, brother. <laughs> And our old brother Sawyer out here. Hallelujah. To just fire the church up. To get us ready to fight. And any of them put the smoothest brother in the world up. And I know y'all expecting me to be that smooth. It's not happening. I'm just, I'm just going to let y'all know up front. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. Praise God. They just came here and just wrecked the place. And then they say, okay, so now we got to close the glory to God. Uh, uh, let me tell you something. The game is won. Amen. I'm just, I'm just here playing out the last inning. Amen. Amen. This game is won. I want to tell you, brothers, you did a, a fabulous, fabulous job on today. I am thankful uh, for the leaders and the elders of this church for the ministers and the membership um, here at the Midway's Church of Christ. And uh, today I went through a confrontation with God uh, as I uh, was getting ready to preach tonight. I, when Pooh told me what I was going to be doing, I, I decided, well, I'm just going to do Psalm 33 tonight. <laughs> The next night and the next night. Just exposit Psalm 33. But my spirit wasn't right. And I know this is weird for y'all. I get it. I, I know this is weird. I, I, I get it. But my spirit wasn't right. I, I, the PowerPoints were beautiful and I had them all ready to go. My outlines, meticulous, ready to go. But my spirit wasn't right. 
So I asked God, what do you want me to say? Uh, and he wouldn't give me nothing at first, so I went and worked out. I did my workout this morning. Uh, and I came back and just put on my heart. And so this is what I'm going to do for the next three nights. I'm just going to exposit James 1. Uh, if, it's, if you shout, praise God. If you don't shout, praise God. Hallelujah. I've been preaching since I was 15. I'm 61. I've learned folk ain't got to like me no more. Amen. But what I got to do is speak the word of God. Amen. So, uh, and the sermon for today is really in verse 12 of chapter 1. Uh, but in order to preach verse 12, we've got to look at verses 1 through 11. And so if you don't mind, just... Just for tonight, I won't do it every night, but it's something we do back at Metro. If you don't mind, stand on your feet as we read James 1, verses 1 through. And Pooh, if, if you don't have to use my slides, you can just use yours. We said King James Version, James 1, uh, uh, verses 1 through 12. Now, if, if, if things are all right, We'll do amen <laughs> down through the end of James. But if they write, if they're not right, just just say, well, he showed enough tried. <laughs> he showed enough tried. He, he really tried and blessed. And just say, bless his heart. Because <laughs> let me tell you what's funny right now. Right now on my iPad, I don't know if you can see that little thing on there, but it refuses to bring up James 1. That's all right. Let's see what we can do it like this. James, the Bible says, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh Patience, but let patience, I believe it says, have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You know what it says? Then he says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, now I've been quoting it. What is the next one? Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted but the rich in that he is made low. For because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat than the grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So shall the rich man be in all his ways. Isn't that right? Then what does it say next? Blessed, Blessed is, the man is the man that endureth, that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown, the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Uh, what does that next verse say? But let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So then lust, when it hath conceived, bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. 
I went, well, I, you know, y'all don't got me, y'all don't got me wired up and fired up already. Go, go, praise God. If you don't mind helping me preach on tonight, look at somebody and tell them if you ain't got nothing else, you sure better have the word. Oh, glory to God, glory to God. Look at him one more time. If you ain't got nothing else, you sure better have the word of God. You may be seated in the presence of God and in the company of his people. James uh, is one of my favorite books of scripture, the book of James, because it's, it's probably the most gangster book in scripture. James doesn't play. He doesn't have the flowery uh, uh, wording of the Apostle Paul. Neither does he have the exalted testimony of Peter. He just comes out in a very rabbinical, didactic way and just tells it like a T.I. is. He ain't got time to fool with us. And there's a reason. Because he first announces himself in verse 1. He says, James, a servant of God. Now, most scholars believe that this James, there are several James in Scripture, but they believe that this James is James, the brother of Jesus. Who, who not until after Jesus died did he even start, and rose again, did he even start believing in Jesus. But it's very interesting because he says, James, I am James, a doulos, a slave, literally. I am a slave of God. It's very interesting how, 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 it just don't, maybe you're different than I. But if I was Jesus' brother, <laughs> in my intro, I would have dropped Jesus' name. Oh, no. It would have been James, a slave of God. It would have been James, Jesus' brother. <laughs> but he said, I am a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, here, he, he, he locates God, Theos, as being uh, as, as our brother Brian said, as creator and as sovereign, but he also located Jesus uh, uh, conjunctively uh, as also Lord, yes. as Kurios, the Lord, Jesus, Yeshua, Messiah. He is Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus the Savior, but he's also Jesus the Savior. He's Jesus Christ, the anointed of God. He says, I'm their servant. I'm the slave. I'm my brother's slave. And maybe you don't have siblings. Uh-huh. But one thing you don't want to do is give your other sibling ammunition. <laughs> I might have dropped his name, but I'm not going to say I'm his slave. But see, this says something about who James is. It shows the humility of James. And notice he's writing, he says, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Now, now this idea of the 12 tribes, it's, it's just a broad term, meaning he's speaking directly or, or most likely to a group of Jewish Christians. And some folk got a problem with that. I have no problem with that because probably when James wrote this, the church was primarily in Jewish areas anyway. But he said, but I want you to notice, he didn't just say to the 12 tribes. He says to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. This word scattered abroad of the, the diaspora. Now those of you who are in African studies, you've heard that term a lot. The diaspora. Africans of the diaspora. Because Africans are all over the world. They're the diaspora. This word diaspora uh, is a conjunction, a Greek conjunction. Dia meaning through or around. And spora, uh, uh, we, you, you, you hear, huh, praise God, and I'm suffering from it right now. Glory to God, during allergy season, the spores. <laughs> so, so, so the diaspora, that, the, the, the 12 tribe which has been seeded. Oh, God. 
all over the world. And I, and I, I believe that as he talks here to these Jewish Christians, he's also talking to the church. And kind of letting us know that, that the church is that is those folks who may be scattered, but their scattering is a seeding. That I never go through something that I'm not seeded where I go. Because I carry the power of God. Does not the Bible tells us that the seed is the word of God? But we also become representational of the seeding of the kingdom. It means that no matter where you're planted, you're expected to grow and produce fruit. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. And I love that because many times when we read things like the Great Commission, either the commission in Mark or the commission in Matthew, we look at them and we say, well, you know, he says, go. And we preach, go. Well, well, if you look at the construction of those passages, though, the actual main verb in those passages, one is make disciples and other is preach. Go is what you call a participle, and a participle never is the main subject. It says, having gone, having gone is a passive participle. Having gone, well, well, having gone is so important. Well, having gone is so important because it lets you know that no matter where you are seated, where no matter where you are, you are about Jesus. You don't got to be commanded to go someplace. Oh, God. Wherever you are, you preach. And wherever you are, you make disciples. You don't have to be on a mission trip. You don't have to be door knocking. Y'all still door knocking around here? You know, I know we, praise God, we don't door knock no more. Glory to God. We, we don't want to look like the other people. Glory to God. I just, I'm just asking, you know. <laughs> when you have your invite campaigns, glory to God. Whatever it is, it doesn't have to be that. It's wherever you are. You are the diaspora. You are those who are scattered abroad. Now, of course, this idea of scattering. There's also, that because you know, we talked about a denotative idea, but there's a connotative idea. Don't worry, if I start, start sounding too egg-heady, just say, Faye, will you please chill? Because <laughs> I get it. Because I, I told Pooh, I said, you know what, I know something, I get way too academic. And folks, you know, they get that glassy look in the eye. They're like, bruh, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I get it. But to understand, a denotation just means the literal kind of definition. Connotation means a shade of meaning. So, so I know we know denotative, this idea of being scattered abroad or being a, a, a seated abroad. But this idea of scattered abroad has a connotation too. It means they're going through something. Because they're not just, they didn't just get up one day and just scatter. They were scattered. Okay, all right, all right, yeah, 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 yeah. They didn't just get up when they said, you know what I think, I'll go into the, <laughs> and I'll just go, no, 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 something happened. Many of them had to get up and run in the middle of the night for their testimony. They were scattered, scattered. So those who are scattered abroad, he says, he says, I want to greet you. Greeting, of course, this, this word, akara, I, I want to send rejoicing to you, uh, my brethren. A, another, another term of endearment showing that we are connected by the blood of Jesus, my brethren, my Delphos, my brethren, those who I'm related to. He says the first thing, what I want you to do, when you're scattered abroad, say, first main verb, he says, count. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Count. Count. Count what it? Count what it? And whatever this it is, I'm going to count it all joy. I want you to notice this idea of counting. Uh, this idea of, of, of giving an accounting. It's, it's, it's a ledger word. It means you, you, you look at the ledger of your life. And you're doing an accounting. And you got profits and losses. Are y'all following this? He says, now, now, in the lost column, there's a whole lot of things you put. But I don't want you to put this in the loss. This you put in the joy column. Whatever this it is, you count it joy. Can somebody shout joy? Because this you're going to count joy. Now I want you to notice he says count it. Somebody say count. He didn't, he didn't say feel it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some of us don't get happy until we feel happy, glory to God. Some of us can't shout until we feel happy, glory to God. He, he didn't say feel joy. 
He says, count it joy. Count it joy. What am I counting joy? He says, count it joy when you fall into. That's one word in the Greek, fall into. It's not fall into. That's when we translated it. It's one word though, fall into. When you fall into. Oh God, this is an amazing word. It has a great shade of meaning. What fall into means is you put yourself in a position, you find yourself in a situation that you didn't put yourself, but it's all around you. You fail. Oh, come on, y'all. You didn't just fall. This is not just about being bushwhacked. You know, like the Galatians writer says, be careful because some of your brethren get bushwhacked. They were going out minding their own business and the devil jumped them. This ain't really talking about that. This is saying you found yourself of no accord of your own. You fell into something. And the, and the, 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 the idea is that you fell into something that surrounds you. You didn't fall into something. It's, it's not like you fell into some situation shit. You know how y'all do that. You find yourself not in a relationship, but you find yourself in a situation ship. <laughs> this is not that. This is not that. This is you fall into something and it's everywhere. You fall into something and it's everywhere. It's unavoidable. Can't turn around. Can't jump out. Can't duck. It's everywhere. You fall into. Notice what he says you fall into. Divers. Multitudinous. Multifaceted. Divers. <laughs> He says, you fall into a situation. Problem is, it's not just one situation. It's divers. <laughs> because maybe if it was one situation, you could deal with it. But it ain't one. It's, y'all are hearing it now. It ain't one, it's. Are y'all following? Just like right now, praise God, if all of y'all started turning up Hennessy and some bourbon, this weed in Kentucky, some bourbon, glory to God, <laughs> and y'all were just getting full and lit up in here, it wouldn't bother me at all because I don't drink at all. Not at all. I don't drink at all. Nothing. Drink and kill my daddy, I ain't about to touch it. I don't even know if Macy remember this story, but back when we were in school, uh, uh, I got a bad cold. Oh, yeah, I <laughs> and my mama <laughs> used to make this stuff called Mojo Juice. <laughs> she would go to the store, get some honey, some lemon, and some liquor. And she would mix it up together, and she'd give you a little bit, and it would knock it right out. And so what I did, I went down to the store, to the liquor store. Now that was very funny to me because when I told them I'm going to the liquor store, all these folks looked at me funny. That's because they don't, didn't grow up like I grew up. See, in Compton, the liquor store was just a store. So if I said I was going to the liquor store, I could be going, I'd have to be going for liquor. I could be going to buy my daddy some camels. Oh, see, y'all ain't old enough to understand. Yeah, all right, y'all don't. Uh, yeah, yeah, back in the day, we could do that. It give you a little note. Y'all don't understand. I, I, could be going, I could be going to buy milk. I got candy because I'm just going to the liquor store because it was just a liquor store in our hood. You had more liquor stores than markets. Amen, amen, amen. So you went to the liquor store. I said, I'm going to go to the liquor store. And I went down to the liquor store and I bought me some liquor this time. I can, I can. I bought some honey and some lemon. I came back and I mixed it up, you know, and I took a, one little stick of it and it was all looking at me. And I took the liquor and poured it all down the toilet. And they would look at me like, bruh. <laughs> what, what are you doing? Because <laughs> I'm not tempted at all by liquor. Are y'all following that? So if, so if they pour, pour me into a diver situation where there's a whole lot of liquor, I'd be cool. Herein lies the issue. 
Now, if it was a whole lot of curvy naked sisters up in there. Ah, uh, see, now we got problems. Oh, see, now, oh, man, I got a problem. Oh, oh, I got, oh, that's too much. Okay, let me, let me ride it back. That's too much for y'all. I think I'm back home, glory to God. You know, praise God. I tell the church, I tell the church, watch out for your preacher. If you see some, cur some curvy, good-looking sister, glory to God, you know, that Belle Bib DeVoe girl, got you, <laughs> y'all don't know nothing about that, got you hemmed up in the corner. And I said, you, you come get me. It's your job to save me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm not going to go to hell trying to be Superman. Yeah, yeah, you come save me. Save my, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That would be a problem. That's really, is that too much? Too much. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You, amen. I remember I had this, I had a meeting with this young, one young lady. Um, she looked all right. Um, uh, well, she, you know, because she thought she looked good. But she looked all right. Anyway, uh, and I met with her at Starbucks. So she wanted to meet again. We met again at Starbucks. And she looked at me, she says, you don't meet with women by yourself. I said, no, I don't. Never. You say, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't trust women? Oh, no, no, no. Women are fine. I don't trust me. I don't trust me. Divers temptations. Are y'all following that? I don't know what your divers is, but you got one. <laughs> I don't know what your divers is, but you got one. It may not be liquor. It may not be thick women. Glory to God. But you got one. You got your something. There's your something. And whatever that is, when you fall into this, He says, count it, joy. Are y'all following this? Are y'all following this? Now, that's just verse one, that's verse two. We just verse one, verse two. That's verse two, my brother. <laughs> then he says, then he gives us the next major verb, knowing. Knowing this. What am I knowing? I got to know what the it is. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Knowing this, it's where gnosko, uh, it, of course it means uh, uh, just regular old knowledge, but it also means the experiential knowledge you get from understanding relationally. Knowing this, knowing this. I just want to drop this, and I know we may not have any folks that's too young in here, but glory to God, but some of y'all younger than me, uh, so I just want to tell you this. That's the reason you need to hang around some folk who've been around God long enough to know some stuff. Because some things you know because you read it, and some things you know because you know. Don't say amen when you can. So he says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, Pooch, Pooch, let me, y'all, you ain't got no, you, 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 I, ain't, I ain't got no watch, I ain't got, I don't know what, what okay, okay. Uh, no, that the trying of your faith, notice, he says, no, notice what, he says, you have fallen into divers temptations. Now, this idea of temptations, we talked about the idea of temptation to sin, but this word, uh, parasmos, uh, it, it can, it's, it's big enough to include not just temptation and sins, but also trials and tribulations. Because sometimes you fall into, and it's divers' trials. You find yourself broke. You wake up one day, and, and the woman you've loved forever turns over and says, I don't love you no more. And it's the last day you're going to see me. See, so this word parasma, it, it, it covers all of that. You fall into it. He says, but know this. Oh, see, the word's trying to set you free here. He says, but know, not feel this. Are y'all following? Know this. See, sometimes you got to know some things. Know this. Because if it, it was feel this, glory to God, none of us would make it. Say amen when you can. You ain't felt like God has, had abandoned you. Is that too real for you? I, I have felt that way before. I felt, God, you've abandoned me. God, why, why you got me out here like this? God, this ain't right. This ain't right. But that was my heart speaking, not my faith speaking. My faith said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. 
See, that's my faith. That's what I know. Are y'all following this? Not only do I know it, I know it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But sometimes I felt abandoned. I remember a time about 10 years ago, uh, uh, I had uh, a super team of ministers with me. And one day they decided we weren't a team no more. And they left me. You say, why do you bring that up? Well, because I prayed to God. I'm mad at God now. This ain't right. And I left my job. Put my family and my kids at risk. And now I'm all by myself. And I remember it was clear. Now, I'm not one of those charismatic folk. I don't, I'm not a guy that thinks that there was a voice from heaven. But I do remember this. And I felt like God said to me, yes, you need them. And it's all right. But I don't. It's all right that you need them. And you do. You're human. You need other people. But I am the Lord God Almighty. If the people don't praise me, the rocks will cry out my name. So yeah, 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 you need them. But I don't. I don't need them. I don't need them. Are y'all following this? And so, and so when he says a trying of your faith, Sometimes you got to know that there's the trying, the trying, the trying of your faith. And I, you say, why are you stick there? We're not stupid. I know you're not stupid. But I'm sticking there because we always miss this. We think God's trying to take your wife or take your husband or take your car. Or the devil's after my home and the devil's after my kids. Well, the devil is not after none of that. The devil's after your faith. And if he needs to, to, to affect your child to get to your faith, if your child is your faith's easy button, he's going <laughs> But he's not after the child. He don't be more care about your child. He don't be more care about your money. He don't care about your house, your job. Because if he can make you idolize your house, he'll let you keep it. Because his job is to try your faith. Are y'all following this? He says the trying of your faith, the trying, the trying is where dokimas. The trying of your faith. This is the idea of trying something to prove genuineness. Yeah, yeah. This is not a trial like Parasmas earlier that you go through trials. This is something you go through that is going to be harsh in order to prove the real. It's the same way they determine whether or not gold is shown of gold. Because some gold, you look at it and it's just as pretty as the other gold. Are you following what I'm saying? When I was growing up, uh, back in the 80s, uh, 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 we were rocking what's called Monet. Y'all don't know nothing about that right there. <laughs> uh, well, you could have just a, a neck full of gold, Monet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And it looked good, too. It looked better than some real gold, that Monet, because it was expensive cheap. <laughs> Monet, but if you melt Monet, it was not gold. But when you melt real gold, it was phony. I gotta, I gotta use that in next time. <laughs> it was phony. <laughs> but if you melt, if you melt real gold, uh huh, what will happen is the gold itself will become molten. But then there's some stuff in it. Some impurities in it called dross that will float to the top. Now, now you can't you can't get rid of the dross unless you try the gold. If you never try the gold, you'll never get rid of the dross. See, because the dross 
makes the gold less valuable. Because the more dross there is, the less value to the gold there is. Now the gold can look gold like gold looks. It can be shiny and beautiful and sparkly. But if until you try it, you can't tell how much dross is in it. See, the problem is, many of our lives, God is allowing us to go through some trying. Because God is getting rid of the dross in our lives. He wants to skim the bad stuff off so that you can come, oh God, did Job say it? Though he try me, yet will I trust him all the days of my appointed time. Are y'all following this yet? But when he tries me, he says, I shall come forth as what kind? What kind? Pure gold. And that's what God is taking you through. So that's where you can count it all joy. Because you know what's going on. But you can't know what's going on outside of community. See, that's when you need to charge. That's when you need to charge. Because you need to be able to talk to Brother Jerry. And ask Brother Jerry, how do I make it when this happens? Because Brother Jerry not only knows, he knows. Are y'all following this? And he can tell you, honey, I got to give you scripture. And I know you don't want to hear scripture because some fool has went out there and told you that when you're hurting, you don't need to go Christians who just going to give you scripture. You need, and that's just stupid. Oh, I, 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 okay, okay. Now, I done lost y'all now. Now y'all mad at me. I mean, y'all done, done listen to her old sermon on how important the word is, glory to God. You listen to her whole sermon on you can't fight without the word, and now you think it's smart to not use the word. <laughs> oh, it's my fault. Like, I know your business. I don't know you. <laughs> I'm from Compton. 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 Y'all say y'all. Okay, all right. <laughs> you. I'm not here from Louisville or praise God. I'm not here from Indiana. I'm from way on the West Coast. But I drop by tonight to tell you that anybody who tells you that when you're hurting, you don't need to hear the word is representing the enemy. Because God is taking you through. He's trying you to give her the dross. But he's not trying your mama. He's not trying your daddy. He's not trying your wife. He's not trying your husband. He's not trying your cutting them. He's not trying your boyfriend or your girlfriend. He's not trying your job. He's not trying your car. He's trying your face. And you say, and I know, I know, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, don't God know already? Well, well, I want you to, because I'm an expositor, look at the first word in verse 3. Right. Knowing this. Not that God need to know. Right. You need to know. You say, well, why do, we, why do they need to know? Because they were scattered abroad. And when you showed up going through something, you need more than just a feeling. You need to know. Are y'all following this? The trying of your faith worketh. It worketh. It worketh. It's King James Version. Worketh. Not works. Worketh. While there is a trying, there's a worketh. You are going through, God is putting in work. But he's not putting in heiress work. That's, that's point time. He's, he's, not, he's putting in progressive work. So as you are going through, everything you go through is him working. Every tear is him working. Every heartache is him working. Every broke day is him working. Hallelujah. Every I'm about to divorce you is him working. Every I'm going to leave you today is him working. Every you fired is him working. Because it worketh. 
But it don't work here just to be working. It's working to produce something called patience. It worketh patience. And the Pooh's already told me, the last thing I can talk about is patience. Very interesting because he ain't being very patient. It work in patience. Patience is not just waiting. Patience is the word hupomone. Hupomone. Hupo, it's, it's, it's prepositional phrase, it means under. Mona, mone means to abide or remain. So hupomone is the ability to remain under something. It means that what I'm going through is giving me the, the ability and the power to make it through. That whatever's over me and on me that I've fallen into, God is working it so I can remain under it. It may seem like it's crushing me, but it's not crushing me. It's giving me power. It's giving me power because God knows what's next. Oh, if I had the next, I, well, tomorrow night we'd be in the next. God knows what's next. See, many times the reason you ain't ready for your now is because when God was dealing with your next, you ran out on God instead of hupomone. You didn't remain under. See, God knew what was going to happen in 10 years. So he took you through something 10 years ago to prepare you for your right now. And you say, well, I ain't ready right now. Well, the reason you're not ready right now is because 10 years ago, you didn't hoop a money. Because he was working it in you. He was working on you. He was giving you power. He was giving you strength. He was making a way out of no way. He was doing everything he could do to give you the strength to make it one more day. I don't know about you, but I'm glad about what I've gone through. Sometimes I get sad, poo, and I, I cry about what I've been through. I cry about how our brotherhood has treated me. I, that's all right. I cry. I don't, I don't mind telling you. I've cried about it. I've cried about some things my friends have done to me. I've cried about it. Praise God. I used to cry about women that left me. Oh, you don't know nothing about that. Oh, no, 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 because the Lord showed me. But see, the Lord showed me I didn't need them because he is prepared. Oh, I don't see here preparing me for this jewel I got right now. Hope on money. So if I can leave you with a word of encouragement. I will say when, when it's going tough on you, hang on in there. I would say when the pressure is up and it feels like you're going to pop, hang on in there. I would say when your trials, your tribulations, your troubles, your hurts, your harms, your happenstance, your problems, your pestilence, whatever you're going through, hang on in there. I had an old lady in the church once to tell me, said, Faith, when you come to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on in there. If I could just get you to hang in there. Can I get one person to look at somebody and tell them you better hang? Yeah. Tell them you better hang. Yeah. Tell them it ain't that bad. Tell them whatever you're going through. It's because God is giving you the power for your next. See, you got a next level God wants you to go through. God wants to level you up. But he knows that you, you got right now, ain't ready to be leveled up. Because glory to God, you got some stuff and you got to squeeze out. So he got to put the pressure on you. Hey. And when he puts the pressure on you, then he squeezes some stuff out. The problem is we like the stuff he squeezes, so you pour it your back in. But God says, I'm squeezing it out because I need to take you to a next level. Anybody ready to go to the next level? Anybody ready to level up? Anybody ready for God to do something great in your life? Well, he got to fix you right now before he can take you to the next level. Because if God wants you to go high up, he got to make you lose a little weight, glory to God. So somebody, oh God, he got to squeeze it out of you. Oh, that's it for today, glory to God. That's it. That's it. That's it. I
Uh, I just let y'all see that I'm, let y'all know that I'm a member of the church if there's anyone here. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> Who has not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you today that the reason you're here is not by happenstance. It's by divine providence. That the words you heard today from either of us, it was for you. Because he was drawing you. Yeah, I'm not Calvinistic, but I believe God draws people. I believe that's Bible. Didn't Jesus say, if I be? Oh, come on, I will. Oh, man, unto me. That's all we've tried to do tonight. Lift up Jesus. Lift up Jesus. Not my power. Lifting up Jesus. When I'm going through struggles and I need to fight, I'm not fighting in my power. I'm lifting up Jesus. Am I right about it? When I'm going through issues and I need a word, I don't look to man's word. I look to the word of God. Amen. And when I'm going through problems, I can make it through because Jesus gives my life. Because he's the Lord. He's my Christ. So maybe you're here today and you needed to hear this word. Jesus died for your sins. He was buried, the Bible says. And he rose again the third day according to the scripture, the Bible says. He said, the Bible says if you want to, to come to him, if you believe that gospel. Now you got to believe it, not just, not just some mental ascent. You got to believe enough that it goes from your head to your hands and your heart. You got to believe enough that it's not just faith up here, but it's also faith in your feet. And if you believe and trust God enough, he says, come to me. Come on to me. And believe me, once you start walking toward him, you're walking away from something. We call that repentance. I know that's an old archaic word. It ain't in the world too much today. But it means leaving that which, which you had and coming to something else. It's a change of mind which leads to a change of state. And then we want you to confess the sweetest name on oh, mortal tongues. The name of Jesus. And we'll bury you in water today. And I know sometimes I don't like using that word because, you know, modern folks are so soft today. You know, you don't like, you, you going to bury me? What? So let, let's, let, let, let's change the vernacular a little bit. We're going to dip you. It's a nicer word. Well, see, submerged, not like you're going to drown somebody. So. <laughs> We're going to merge you under submerge. <laughs> But whatever words you need, we're going to put you in some water. Amen. Amen. Now the water, I don't, I don't, know, what the, I don't know what the water is. Kentucky General, I don't know what it is. It's just water. It's just water. What makes it special is your faith and the operation of God, Colossians says. And God will change you tonight. I'm just Holy Ghost believing enough to believe that. I believe that when he gives you the gift of the Holy Ghost, he doesn't give for nothing. Hallelujah. And maybe here tonight, and you've been living under something, but you keep running out of it. I want to encourage you. You ain't got to come down there. I want you to live it. I want you to decide tonight that whatever God's going, taking me through, I'm going to count it all joy. Whatever it is, I don't know what your it is, but whatever your it is, I'm going to put it in my ledger on the joy side. I'm going to stop complaining about it. Because my complaint is just me and my feelings. Are you following? What I'm going to do is I'm going to say what I know. And I know this is all joy. So come on, stand to your feet. Amen. I, I went four minutes over. Um, Y'all forgive me. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Whatever you want to say, brother. I still have joy. Yes, sir. You know I still have joy. After all the things I've been through. Yes, I still have joy. Do you have it? I still have. You know I still have. Hey, after all the things, you know I still have. Said I got peace, I still have. You know I still have. Yes, after all, hey, you know I still have. Said I've got joy, I still have. Oh, I still have. Yes, after all, you know I still have joy. Church, say amen. Do you got some joy? We go through a lot of things, but put it in the joy 
call him. If you ain't got nothing else, he said, you better show enough have the word of God. We're thankful for Brother Haygood on tonight, and we're looking forward to him throughout the rest of the week. A um, couple of prayer requests. Um, Sister Marion Mason, we just got word. She has been admitted to the hospital. Um, she's at Mary and Elizabeth Hospital. Please keep her in prayer. Um, Sister Linda. Oh. Um, also, continue to pray for the blues. Um, baby Lily had surgery earlier this morning on her kidneys, um, but she's doing well. Surgery went well. She's in recovery. So pray for uh, little Lily and, and Justin and Tierra um, as they're dealing with her, Brother Joe. Brother McGill is in the emergency room as well. One of our deacons here. I want to make sure we pray for Brother Dwayne McGill. God has all things under control. We ask, at the appropriate time, we ask Brother Dorsey to uh, lead our closing prayer. But we're thankful for all those who have been here on tonight. Were you blessed on tonight? Come back tomorrow. And God has a word for you tomorrow at 12 o'clock. Um, at our noontime, we have Brother Kenneth Ray. He'll be with us tomorrow at noontime. We're excited. Um, and that's open to everybody. Some people think it's just for specific people. No, every, it's open to anybody who has time in the day. Please come, ask your questions, make comments, and we will discuss the word of God at 12 o'clock tomorrow. Then tomorrow night at 6 p.m., we'll have our nightly lectures. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm trying to think of who we have tomorrow night. We have Brother Macon, if I'm not mistaken, on tomorrow night um, from the West Broadway Church of Christ. And we also have Brother Rodney Britt from the Northside Church of Christ there in uh, Jeffersonville, Indiana. We're going to have a great time tomorrow night as well. Um, also, before, at, at around 5.30, there's some light refreshments that we have as well. So if you're getting off work, you're like, I need a bite to eat, just go ahead and come on here. You ain't got to stop at home. You can get you a little something to eat and be ready for the word at 6 o'clock. If there is nothing else, let us all together stand. And we'll have a closing song and a closing prayer by Brother Dorsey. It's in my veins, it's in my veins, it's in my veins, Lord, it's in my veins. While the blood is running warm, you know it's in my veins, oh Lord, it's in my way down in my veins, it's in my veins. It's in my veins, Lord, it's in my wow. The blood is running warm, you know it's in my veins. Oh, Lord, it's in my veins. Amen. If everyone is like me, uh, you feel a little strengthened after all the word of God tonight. It came from all different angles and in all different ways, but it had one deep meaning, is to hold on to faith. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you, approaching your th throne of grace, Father, thanking you first and foremost for allowing us to hear different portions of thy word, Father, knowing that we need the, your word, Father, to be able to survive in this world, Father. Amen. Father God, we got a, a brief look at things we should and should not do, Father, but we know the things we should do is according to thy will. Amen. Father God, we know that your will will be done, Father. We ask you to continue to be with us and bless us and keep us as we uh, strive to do what thus saith the Lord. Amen. Father God, help us to get home safely as we leave this place, Father, and allow us to come back again at the next appointed time, Father, to hear another portion of thy word. Amen. Father God, we know that you, we love you and we, we uh Know that our strength comes through you, Father, and we ask you to continue to bless us and, and forgive us any of our shortcomings, Father, that we may come across, Father. We know that the ever-cleansing blood of your son Jesus is with us. Father, we ask you again, Father, to continue to bless us and keep us as we leave this place. Father, let us get home to our homes the way we left them, Father, and continue to bless us throughout our life. This is my prayer in the name of your blessed son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross for all our shame. Christ is our example.
of how to live our lives each day. So I'll read about him in his word and trust him and obey. Whatever is true, whatever is right. 